Good morning, everyone. My name is Mohammed Ansari. I'm from uh, University of Kansas. I'm an uh, assistant professor in internal medicine. And uh, I would like to present a case to you all. Let's see, next. So uh, my case is a 60-year-old male with a uh, medical history of uh, hepatitis C, hypertension, and hemorrhagic stroke who presented to the ER from a skilled nursing facility uh, for complaints of abdominal pain, chest pain, and dark-colored stools. He had uh, low blood pressure coming into the hospital. Um, he did not receive any aspirin, nitroglycerin, or heparin uh, due to concerns for uh, GI bleeding. Um, past medical history comprised of uh, hepatitis C, hypertension, and stroke. Surgical history had knee replacement. Uh, mother had history of heart failure, and uh, cancer runs in the family in paternal aunt and uncle. Uh, smoker, four cigarettes a day, occasional alcohol, no known allergies, aspirin, and statin, and pentobarbital in his medication list. Uh, review of systems um, showed he's positive for melina. And uh, these are his labs, um, significant for a uh, elevated white count at 8.8 .8 and uh, low hemoglobin at 8.6. And uh, electrolyte panel mostly looked okay. Troponin was elevated at 1.31. And uh, the repeat troponin uh, came back at 1.7. And then um, the EKG showed uh, ST elevation in the lateral leads. So, you know, patient coming in for chest pain, troponin elevation, ST elevation, uh, he went to cath lab from there. So in the cath lab, uh, he had a coronary angiogram, uh, which did not show any uh, obstructive uh, coronary artery disease. Um, Pressure uh, hemodynamics showed uh, 72 or 53 in the cath lab with a left ventricular and diastolic pressure of uh, 9. And uh, there wasn't any uh, gradient on the aortic valve uh, catheter pullback. Uh, a ventricular gram was performed subsequently, and it showed an ejection fraction of uh, 15 to 20 percent on uh, visual estimation. And uh, there were some uh, regional wall motion abnormalities consistent with uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So the conclusion of the interventionalists uh, was this is uh, likely cardiogenic shock in the setting of uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And um, the patient was then uh, started on dopamine and an intraartic balloon pump was placed in the cath lab for cardiogenic shock and then he was subsequently transferred uh, to the CICU. He did not have a right heart cath performed prior to the placement of the intraartic balloon pump. Uh, a limited echo was performed, which showed a possible SAM, and uh, due to concerns for left ventricular outflow tag obstruction, uh, his dopamine was weaned off and switched over to vasopressin and uh, norepinephrine for pressure support. And uh, GI was also consulted because of his uh, melina history, and then uh, IV pantoprazole was started uh, that time. In the CICU, a PA catheter was placed bedside, and uh, it showed the uh, falling hemodynamics. So uh, PA, PA uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressure was 6, uh, CVP of 3, and then you can see the cardiac output was 4.4, and the cardiac index was 2.4 with an elevated systemic uh, vascular resistance. So, so this looks like, you know, uh, most likely this is not cardiogenic shock at that point because his cardiac index uh, looked okay. Um, then, subsequently, you know, he was resuscitated with uh, IV fluids, and then he was given two units of packed red blood cells, and then the intraartic balloon pump was weaned off after improvement. And the next morning, he had another echo, which showed uh, moderately reduced systolic function with the akinesis of the FI two-thirds on the left ventricle with an hyperdynamic function of the basal one-third, the EF of 35%. He then had uh, EGD performed the same day. Uh, that showed uh, long segment Barrett's esophagus and some esophagitis and also a non-bleeding duodenal ulcer. Um, his pressure support was weaned off subsequently um, over the next day, and then the patient improved, his uh, lactic acid improved, and then uh, he was then uh, started on the beta blocker and uh, aldosterone blocker uh, before discharge. So I thought uh, this was an interesting uh, presentation with mixed picture. Um, who got an entire balloon pump, and then uh, subsequently uh, looked like uh, he had possibly hypovolemic shock instead, looks like. Um, just a few words, trivia, kind of, on Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, different names, stress-induced cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. In this case, actually, uh, this patient had a, a divorce of uh, 25 years, so he had uh, Takotsubo most likely probably from that, 
from stress. And then uh, apical ballooning syndrome is another name. Tako is the Japanese word for octopus, and suho is the Japanese word for uh, pot or trap. Um, it's uh, usually because of the ventricular gland takes the shape of an octopus pot, and hence the name Takotsubo. So I was looking over some uh, papers, and it looks like the incidence of cardiogenic shock in Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is around maybe 4%. So I think uh, they were trying to, you know, uh, do the right thing for the patient. And, um, and then later on it showed that he po possibly had uh, cardiogenic, uh, uh, instead of cardiogenic shock, he probably had uh, hypovolemic shock. So I thought it was an interesting presentation. And uh, So these are always challenging patients. It's interesting that he had, I think, a remote subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yes, yes. So uh, for my neurosurgery colleagues, acutely, subarachnoid hemorrhage has a prevalence of between 12 and 17 percent of Takasubos during the acute event. We also see that, by the way, post-transplant. Uh, we've seen that particularly in the post-liver transplant population, populations for reasons that aren't very clear. Um, the other question, though, I'd love to have seen the angiograms because they're now, are, you know, this is a gentleman, don't really have the incidence of stress. There are increasing numbers of individuals that, are, that do have evidence of uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection in, in combination with this. So, so a point to consider is making very sure that there's not any evidence of SCAD associated with that as one of the comorbid problems. That was an excellent presentation. I think this case uh, really highlights what we've been talking about over the last day and a half, is that not all shock is created equal. There was a really nice paper that came out about a year ago in Jack Heart Failure. It was about eight years of uh, looking at patients coming in with cardiogenic shock, and they compared those with Takasubo versus those with AMI. Higher incidence of respiratory failure, mechanical ventilation, but less of um, kidney failure and the other things that can be seen with AMI. But it also highlights the fact that you know, that the therapy should be purely be tailored to these patients. They have a quicker recovery, lower mortality. They do not do well with axial flow devices for obvious reasons, uh, basilar hyperkinesia. And if, and if we are going to use a presser on these patients because they quickly recover, usually phenylephrine is a better choice rather than a drug like norepinephrine, which can um, obstruct the outflow. Let me ask the panel, uh, Takasuba is not a one-time event if you go by what we understand now. So what is the recurrence and how long do you treat them after the index event is over? Excellent question. I actually wanted to ask you that. <laughs> so there are a couple of papers and I just would like what you are doing in your center. So we are going for aspirin only that missed in, in this. Uh, I haven't seen it at least. And seeing the Lancet TRET trial, I would treat them pretty long actually with ACE and beta inhibition, a beta block on ACE inhibition pretty long, probably at least for a year, so that's what, what we are doing. But we stopped the, set, the PY, uh, to, uh, uh, P2Y12 uh, uh, inhibition, we stopped that now after that papers, but obviously data is very uh, weak in that regard. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and again, as a community cardiologist, this is a very common scenario. Uh, was there a stress event in this patient that you yeah. ever identified? Yeah, so like I, like I was saying at the end, uh, he had a uh, divorce of 25 years. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah, I missed so, that part. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the other question is, you know, how often do you, at what point do you follow up with an echo? Do you follow up with an echo? I mean, I typically do it about uh, three months and then probably a year later, not every year. But definitely I continue to keep seeing these patients in my clinic and uh, um, more often than not, unless there's some contraindication, just continue them on the ACE inhibitor or beta blocker. Um, just another point on the uh, hemolytic perspective. I think this case is quite interesting because uh, um, you mentioned some um, uh, left ventricle flow tract obstruction. Nevertheless, I mean, the uh, end diastolic pressure was nine. When you measure it with a PA catheter, it was six. Um, this does not go well with this obstruction. Um, maybe, and my point will be here, is that this patient also had a cardiac index of 2.4, even though he was with this very impaired cardiac function. So it's really, in my mind, a mixed feature of a severe vasodilation, um, and this was probably uh, promoting this obstruction or pseudo-obstruction we had, in a hypovolemic case, by the way, on, on the other hand, um, and on top of this, with the Takotsubo. So you really had the three different lines of the vasodilation, 
um, maybe cirrhosis, I don't know exactly, um, with, together with the Takotubo that was obviously here, and with uh, some um, abstraction at the, at the end, but not leading to the classical pattern of the LVO2 abstraction. So I uh, think that uh, at some point when you switch your vasopressor, it was a very good choice. I hate dopamine, so it's that good that you switched uh, to something else, and vasopressin was probably a good one here, phenylephrine maybe, and, um, and at the end, indeed, the um, beta blockers for the long term, given the liver problems that this patient seems to have, seems also a very good choice here. So, uh, a question to the panelists. Um, this is in regards to the diagnosis or events leading to the diagnosis of Takasubo, and using uh, what kind of criteria you use, uh, thinking about intertax and mayos, and uh, distinctly recall a patient uh, who had three episodes of Takasubo and then eventually got diagnosed with FIO. And intertax clearly doesn't really talk about you, uh, really investigating for FIO unless there's something obvious which indicates towards FIO. Uh, how do you usually approach such situations? And in the similar context, a uh, patient did have reduced EF, so was on goal-directed medical therapy with metoprolol. Uh, how do you see beta blockers and then empirically using them in Takasubo without ruling out FIO? Very good point. I think uh, all of us who have been burnt once with the FIO now look for FIO every time a patient sneezes. And I've also had a Takasubo patient who turned out to be a FIO, a very prominent stock broker. He also went through the stress as hard as the stress of divorce. Um, but that's a, because that's a treatable condition because there is an alpha-beta uh, disbalance and you can have vasospasm. But what percentage of people have few out of Takasuba? I think it's a very small number. I don't know the number at the top of my head, but it's a very small number. The real question is, if someone knows the answer, you can tell me later. When there's a divorce, which is a higher incidence of Takasubo in the husband or the wife? <laughs> we'll figure it out later. I'll, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Great presentation.